the topic for today is product frameworks. Um, I usually love to start off with an example. As product managers, uh, you need to communicate to various teams. And the very first example I'm going to use is this news article. This actually came out literally four days ago. Uh, and what the news article says is Harley Davidson, which is an existing motorcycle company, which is pretty famous for the brand of motorcycles, is actually bringing out an electric motorcycle. They kind of named it Lightwire. What makes a company like Harley Davidson, which has been around for the past 70 or 80 years, and which has sold motorcycles the old way, bring out something which looks like this. Imagine if you were the product manager for Harley Davidson, and you were tasked with coming out with this idea. Is there a method to the madness? Is um, How does a product manager synthesize competing set of priorities and come up with an idea out of it? So this is what product frameworks is all about. Um, product frameworks can help give you structured thinking. And I'll show you with an example how this could work. Uh, the traditional MVP evolution is this way. Say you were the product manager at Harley Davidson. You wrote a requirement that you want to get from point A to point B. The very first iteration of this could look like the skateboard. The, sco the skateboard can get you from point A to point B. But as part of your product requirement, you might not have put in requirements such as, I need to get there at 30 minutes per minute or I need to get there with this particular velocity. So traditionally, in your MVP, you build, iterate, <laughs> test, and kind of improve. Your next iteration could look something like this, a tricycle with practice rules, where you refine your product requirements and say, I want to get from point A to point B, but quite securely. A skateboard need not be as secure. Right? When going at 30 miles per hour, you might follow the skateboard. So you as the product manager refine the requirements further and say, I require stability, which is an absolute requirement as part of my home. The next, you, you take this out in the field, you test it out, you discover additional flaws. That's all uh, part of the iteration build and test cycle. Your next iteration could look something like this. You build upon the stability of the tricycle. The tricycle was more stable than the skateboard. The bicycle is a little more stable than that you added a little bit more velocity. So you as a product manager are continuing to iterate and improve upon the idea from getting from point A to point B. Your fourth iteration could actually look something like this. Having ridden the bicycle, it might still feel quite slow for you. You might decide, actually I need to be going at 40 miles per hour, which the scooter can definitely do for you. So you build upon the iteration of the bicycle and end up with the scooter. And finally, after a lot of beta testing, you get to the 300cc motorcycle, which is what was the vision. But how does a product manager get from that point to this point? There needs to be a way to synthesize various set of data to come up with the MVP, which is what product frameworks can actually help with. One of the most common challenges in product management is you got to communicate across various disciplines. Uh, you are mostly an individual contributor. You work with engineering, you work with test operations, marketing. You need to influence people without the people actually having to report to you. One of the most common definitions is a product manager is a mini CEO. You're responsible for the product. You're responsible for how well the product does. Uh, so think of it like building a house. The framework is kind of like the scaffolding, which gives structure to the house. The reason you require a structure is you're trying to bring structure out of chaos because you have a lot of requirements. One of the common answers, whether it's in product management interviews or in companies, is uh, people say, talk to the customer. Sure, talking to the customer will actually give you a good set of data, and you should actually talk to the customers. But it will give you so much data that you'll have trouble distilling all of that data into a coherent set of requirements. So what frameworks does is uh, they provide structure. They will also help uncover areas which require a deeper focus. If I go back to the example of the skateboard, you could get to point A to B with the skateboard, with the bicycle or the tricycle, 
but you can only get from point A to point B with a certain velocity with the motorcycle right at the end. If you had a framework for thinking, this would actually be uncovered in the first step of the process. A good product manager would ask the right questions while writing the product requirements itself. Uh, it can also reduce the design iterations. It took you five design iterations to kind of get from the skateboard all the way to the motorcycle. With the right framework, you would probably do it in two design iterations. And time is definitely money, especially if you're in a startup, because you need to get to market much sooner. You need to fail fast. A framework can actually deliver all of this problem. Frameworks can also solve some of the other problems. Uh, Essentially, most problems in product management require some sort of boundary, like estimate how big the market is going to be for a new product. Estimate why this particular feature needs to go versus a different feature. Your time and resources are limited. Your engineering time is precious. You need to convince engineering these are the right set of features, which means you're essentially putting a boundary on the problem. And frameworks can actually do that for you. Also, root cause analysis becomes much easier. Later, when you do A-B testing or other kind of data testing in the product, you can actually couple frameworks with the A-B kind of testing. And we'll talk about that as well. With the right root cause, root cause analysis, you will uncover the persona for the customer. In my very first example, the persona of a person who rides the skateboard is much different than a motorbike rider. Both get from point A to point B. But their spending habits, the way they maintain the skateboard, the way they make purchases for the motorcycle maintenance is way different. In the mobile space, especially, acquisition of customers is easy, but you need to retain customers. I'll talk about this in the later slides too, but most apps actually lose 90% of their customers within the first three months of a download, which means you need to focus on retaining the customers. And you can only do that by focusing on the right persona and then building the right set of customer features. So we'll talk about three different types of frameworks. Actually, if you do a little bit of Googling, you'll come up with hundreds of frameworks, and there have been many researchers who have come up with various frameworks. I will focus on a few which I have found useful during my product management journey. We'll start with product ideation frameworks because it all begins with the idea. The idea is really key. We'll look at two frameworks, namely the five whys, the reversal, and also touch upon the journey map frameworks. Um, we'll look at prioritization frameworks, which is where most of the heavy lifting is going to happen. We'll look at the Kano model, we'll look at the Moscow model, and then stack rank because it's really crucial for a product manager to weigh different kinds of priorities. We can also look at financial prioritization, uh, benefit versus cost. Uh, we look at pirate metrics, which have been around for a long amount of time. And at the very last, we'll also look at product strategy frameworks, because in the mature cycle of the product, or when the product is released, you need to tweak your product strategy depending on the product market fit, depending on where you're kind of selling the product. The very first framework that I'm gonna look at uh, it's going to be an ideation framework, and we'll call this the reversal method. So this is a problem. Uh, think, think of it like this. You're a product manager for a retail company. You're looking at various segments, and the problem is um, parents with newborn babies are often sleep deprived, which is well known, and do not have time to cook hot meals. They also tend to order large quantities of wipes, diapers, and baby products. You as a product manager, you're looking at the segment. What catches your eye is they're ordering large quantities of wipes, diapers, and baby products. You want to bring out a product and want to sell in the segment. So how do you come up with an idea at the very start of what do you do? What the reversal method tells us, you take the problem and actually reverse it. So you start off with the problem and make it the starting point. This is what a potential solution could look like. The main problem is they're sleep deprived, they do not have time, they're also spending money on the rest of the white diapers and work. You as product manager, there are many ways to do this. One of the ideas could be you launch a subscription service with low prices for naturally created baby products. You're solving their one problem, which is the baby problems. Two, also provide them a hot meal delivery because they really don't have the time at discounted rates. 
and you sweeten the pain by giving them a monthly substance. This is one way you could use the reversal method. Uh, another example, kind of illustrate the reversal method. One of the common problems most of social media right now is fake profiles and fake news, and it's dominated both the election cycle and other kind of stuff. So as of early 2018, the number of fake Facebook accounts was about 583 million. Total active accounts were about 2.5 billion. So just to give you a sense of the numbers, you could see close to 25% of those profiles are all fake profiles. So as fake accounts grow, they start to affect the experience for the rest of the users. It's not bought into that point, but you are a product, imagine you're a product manager at a social media company. Fake profiles are starting to perform right And it affects the experience for everybody else because of the connected experience. Most users do not have time to police or crowd identify their needs. You as a product manager for a social media company what to do. With you. you would apply the reversal method too and do something like this. You as a product manager could possibly launch a product plugin for Facebook which leverages machine learning tools. The key is the machine learning tools because the central pain point in all of this is customers' experience is being affected and they really don't have the time to use any sort of policing or crowd identifier. You want to make this as seamless as possible for the customers, which is why you leverage those machine learning tools to identify fake profiles. And fake profiles are easy to identify. Uh, they usually don't have photos. They don't, they're not connected to a lot of people. They don't share updates. You could use any one of those criteria to filter out by using machine learning all the uh, You could also run the posts against websites like politifact.com or snopes.com or factchecker.com. Uh, people also love getting back at trolls and all kind of fake profiles. You could reward users with merchandise coupons. You are a social media company. You make money out of advertising. You want to gamify this. You want to incentivize people to actually do this. So you could roll out something like this, which would improve your engagement rate and your retention rate. So the reversal method works well in most of the cases. There are certain cases where the reversal method doesn't work. Um, if you're trying to break into a brand new segment, Say you were a product manager at Tesla, it's maybe 2005, 2006. There were no electric cars before. The reversal method might not exactly give you uh, something to do with it. You might have to rely on some of the other things. So the reason you're reversing it, for example, you're taking the problem and you're actually spinning it into a solution. You're addressing the central pain point. For example, in the first thing, the pain was they don't have time. They can't. They don't have time to cook the hot meals, which you're providing the hot meal delivery service. At the same time, you're noticing they're buying a lot of baby products. You're coupling both because product requirements inherently are at the intersection of both the customer pain point and the business need as well. You need to make money as well, which is what. The next framework we we'll look at is actually called Five Whys. It's quite a powerful method. In fact, many of the business leaders have spoken about it. People have said, think of it uh, like a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old asking you with simple sense. They constantly keep on asking you why, why, why. It's actually a very powerful one. And we can look at it with an example. You are the product manager for an online media services company, Comcast, Disney, any or Netflix. Um, you notice that sports subscriptions for events such as Thursday Night Football, in fact, there's a game going on right now, Packers versus Seahawks, I believe. They have seen a steady decline over the past year. You're tasked with launching a product to remedy this. The way you look at this problem, you can't outright apply the reversal method. This is another example. You do know that the subscriptions have been fallen, but you need additional information to kind of find out where you can pitch a product, which is why the five whys actually fits very well for this. So the way this works is, and the structure is not important, what you need to get to is the root cause. Somebody could make a table like this. You ask the very first question, why are subscriptions falling? And who do you ask this to? You as a product manager in the company, you obviously talk with the business development managers, the sales managers. You have your forums. 
you go to your forums, you go to your sales people, your business development people and ask this question, why are subscriptions for? And one answer could be, customers do not find the experience immersive to pay for a separate subscription. The real, uh, the real root cause you are looking for in this answer is, it's not immersive. You are sitting in your living room, you are watching this Thursday night football or basketball, it's not like you are you're standing in a stadium. So people are not finding the value to pay extra for a non-immersive experience. So you take the root cause which comes in the first one, you turn it into your second question. So your second question could be, why is the experience not immersive? You dig one layer deeper. The answer could be, from whoever it is, whether it's your business development manager or an actual set of data customers, it's hard to recreate the magic of being in an actual stadium and witnessing a last second buzzer beater or a Hail Mary pass by watching this in a 1080 TV. It could be a different resolution, but what they're really trying to say is it's it's not the same. One possible root cause here could be is your video resolution is too poor. So you take that and turn it into your third question. Um, why is the video at 1080p? And the answer could come as 4K broadcasts are network intensive. They are. And adding a 4K module to TVs will impact flat screen size. It could turn out your flat screen goes from this width to this width. It's a hypothetical answer. You know, not necessarily that it's true. It would also add cost to the TVs and other services, but it's a valid answer. The real answer, the real pain point here is 4K broadcasts are network intensive and flat screen sizes and the viewing experience could be affected by this. You take that root cause and ask your fourth why. Why do you have to watch this on flat screen? And the variations of this. So you could, at this point, it's a little bit of intuition. The product manager could decide to peel down in a different kind of way. You could decide to attack the network problem. You could decide to attack the flat screen problem. Say you could come up with a pitch where you say, I'm going to put a, like a Google Chromecast plugin into the TV and I'm going to solve both of your problems. Which is going to be capital intensive because you don't have to come up with the capital to build a new device. Say your mandate was, do not bring in new devices, find a way to remedy the sports substation. Which is why my fourth why is, why do you have to watch this on a flat screen here? And the answer could be, Sure, if not a flat screen TV, you could watch it on some other surface. If it was not immersive on a flat screen TV, it won't be immersive on a tablet, it won't be immersive on a laptop. The most immersive technology that exists today is a virtual reality picture or an augmented reality picture. You could peel it one level further and say, why can't you watch this on a virtual reality picture? So the next answer could be, Virtual reality headsets with 4K do not have Netflix laptops. I'm just making it up as I'm here, but it's more to illustrate the point. So the real pain point is the VR app system is very poor. You do not have streaming service to VR, with which you could stream Thursday night football to the users. So your final why is probably going to look something like this. You take the pain point that you got in the fourth why and you put it this way. Why do VR sets do not have apps? You come to the last of your five wines, and now you know what you need to build, or at least you have an idea. So the answer could be, we are sets are power intensive, they are, because um, you do not have a physical connection. If you have a physical connection, it kind of spoils the seamless experience. Most wireless VR sets have a battery. And with a battery, if you have a power intensive application one, it can actually drain it pretty fast. Maybe you drain it in 20 minutes, which is a pretty poor customer experience. So the answer could be VR sets are power intensive. Video broadcasting at 4K will require a physical connection to a laptop. So now you know, if you want to remedy it, one of the ways is by building a VR set with this app system, with the ability to stream 4K. And you as a product manager could actually pitch this. So your final requirement is going to look something like this. You focus on the last why, but do take the rest of the pain points also into consideration. You can launch a VR headset with wireless charging, so it solves the power problem without a need for a physical connection. You utilize the free Android ecosystem to bring a Netflix like that, uh, which will bring the 4K video transfer. Now you have an immersive service. 
you sell the device in a bundle deal with the sports and equipment software just like in the cell phone model, like a device plan, which is what most carriers do, so that customers also sign up for the subscription service. Allow fans to stream, record their point of view. People love sharing, and you're sitting in the stadium, you just witness the buzzer beater. You want to experience this with your best friend sitting miles away? You allow them to stream through the app so that your friend feels as if he's literally sitting in the stadium. So now you're bringing value to the customers compared to a normal TV, which is a very disconnected experience. With this, you actually allow them to kind of reel it from you. This is how a good uh, product pitch should read like. This is how a product requirement should be written because you're bringing value in not just an add-on subscription or something, something which is distinctly different. Uh, the last framework that we look at as part of ideation is called a journey map. It's called by other names too. Uh, the essential advantage of this method is a lot of product managers talk about empathy. The most overused term is empathy. Uh, and people love to imagine they can walk in the feet of the customer. If you can actually do it, it's great. It will make for a great product manager. I'd rather focus on a more database approach to actually feel like what the customer is doing to uncover the pain point of the customer is one of the advantages of using the journey map. The structure is not important. What you identify with the journey map is there is a baseline, there is an enhanced experience, and there is an unpleasant experience. Customers fall into two categories. I won't bother with the kind of category which doesn't care or is indifferent. That's not useful for this discussion. You map out uh, the various portions of the product that you're trying to build. Just for the sake of continuity, I'll pick up on the 4K um, VR headset example. So in this case, I have my baseline, I have the enhanced and the unpleasant experience. You prepare the headset, you experience the headset, you enhance it with whatever kind of features. Then there's a social aspect of the friends and the fans sharing their videos. You relive your moments and you put down your headset. So this is the sequence that I'm kind of gonna go through. So if I were the product manager and I, were, I want to imagine what the customer is going through, so as part of so as part of the prepared portion of the sequence, it's pretty simple. You are the customer. You put on the headset, which is same both in the enhanced and then in the unpleasant experience. In the enhanced version of it the headset feels pretty light. It's literally like feather weight. You don't even notice. If it were a very clunky headset sitting on your forehead, you wouldn't be able to enjoy any kind of it. So I would put the headset feels light in the enhanced experience and feels heavy in the uh, unpleasant experience. The next one is you want to experience video. That's the whole reason you put on this uh, headset. In the enhanced experience, the video streaming works. It works seamlessly, there is no delay. You just put it on, network latency is non-existent. Uh, the VR experience is great. You have a full 360 degrees view. You literally feel like you're standing on the stadium. In the unpleasant experience, the video streaming is choppy. I mean, you're seeing kind of glitches on the screen, and now the VR experience is poor. You're able to make up their own, so on and so forth. So this is part of the experience portion of the video. Then comes the enhanced version. Sure, you put on the headset to experience video, but the real reason was you wanted immersive video. So in an enhanced portion, the 4K video is pretty crisp. It's absolutely crystal clear. The surround audio works. Everything is great. In the unpleasant experience, it's a clunky 4K video. There's a possibility normal video could have worked, but the 4K video could not have worked. So it kind of gives you a map. Uh, the, the nice thing about the journey map is you can actually map out features which work and don't work. So you could have you could have a product where normal video works, but 4K video could be clunky. So the journey map is literally building out a map for you of what feature is working and what is not working. Then comes the social aspect. Uh, you definitely want people to share posts. You want it to be seamless with, with the click of a button, you send out this video uh, to your friend or whoever it is. 
a single sign-on across platforms where you sign on once into the app, it signs you across Facebook, Twitter, all of your social feeds. In the unpleasant experience, video embedding fails, if it's not easy, it's a multi-step process, you have to do multiple sign-ons. Um, sitting on a Friday evening with this headset on your head, nobody wants to do multiple sign-ons. It's just not part of an intuitive kind of design. So the journey map will literally paint the picture for what's happening to the customer. And the very last thing is reliving the moment. Often people have photos and videos on their mobile phone. So the journey map actually forces you to think. This is a this is a thing which you could have missed writing your product requirements in a normal kind of way. With the journey map, you have to kind of go through each step. I want a mobile pass from my device to the headset and relive a different moment. Maybe I was in Hawaii with a friend. I want to watch that in the air. Um, albums and tagging work seamlessly. As part of the unpleasant experience, your mobile doesn't connect to the headset. I can't tag videos. Overall, it's a pretty crappy experience. And the very last thing is you remove the headset in both cases. All your videos are synced, nicely tagged, arranged in an album. In the unpleasant experience, just like I said, the nice thing about this thing is you could have something go great until this point. <coughs> In the unpleasant experience, all of this would have been great, but your videos might not have been safe, which uncovers potential flaws with the, um, with the kind of device you're trying to do. One other nice thing about this method is it works very well with A-B testing. If you want to really fail fast, you don't want to wait until your product is going to go for a general release. You want to test it pretty early. As you can notice, the whole format is in an A-B kind of format. You could actually have two sets of people if it was a physical product, or you could have two sets of beta testers if it was a software product, and actually go through this entire experience, which is one of the strong points for this particular kind of thing. Okay, so that was the last of the ideation frameworks. Now we get to product priority frameworks. So you've done your stuff, you've done the five whys, you've gone through your journey map, you talk to customers, now you have a bunch of data. The crucial thing is now you need to prioritize because time and resources are definitely limited. Um, when evaluating competing set of priorities, you need a way to weigh one priority against the other depending on what set of criteria you're kind of marching on. And this is going to really depend on the company and the criteria that you are using. Say you're launching a new product which needs to generate 15 million for the, within the next one year of launch. It's absolutely a business plan. Say you have been given a goal where you're launching a mobile app where you want to get to 3 million daily users. That's a different set of plan. The overarching business goal or the company goal will kind of set the tone for what you're going to do in the prior years. But essentially, it requires a way to kind of you know decide between competing priorities. And this can make all the difference between a successful product and a failed one. Uh, it also increases the success rate of strategic projects. You can actually use prioritization across projects to kind of decide this particular project has this feature which would solve the most immediate customer pain point. You can actually use it to choose between projects. You also want to align the strengths of the organization. You could have an engineering team which is great at mobile app design, and you as a product manager could come up with a pro product which requires hardware expertise, just like the 4K video heads. If you do a product prioritization exercise, you might actually uncover your engineering team is very well versed with the mobile app design and maybe give up the idea towards more. So prioritization can actually help align the strengths versus what you want to do for the customer. So one of the models that I'm going to talk about is the Kano model. Um, so this model is credited to Professor Kano from Japan. Came up in the 1970s during the manufacturing boom. In fact, a lot of the agile methods and starts development methods all came from Toyota and the Japanese car manufacturing companies. Um, this is how this model works. Oh. The Kano model synthesizes various kind of information. It looks like a lot of information. I'll break it down for you. Basically, what we want to do is collect a bunch of customer information and then get it on this quadrant. The x-axis of the quadrant is basically functionality. It could be functionality of the app, it could be functionality of the device, so on and so forth. 
At the extreme left hand side, it's the quadrant where customers are indifferent. You release a product which really doesn't excite them. On the right hand side of the x-axis is high functional. It's a product which really meets their needs. On the y-axis, it's delight versus frustration. Because you could have a functional product, but it still might be quite frustrating for you. Just like the 4K headset would solve your problem of being immersive, but if say tagging is not working, it would actually fall uh, within the basic expectation kind of not knowing. What this does is it creates these four quadrants and the four quadrants are, this is the basic expectation, you absolutely have to meet it. This is the performance also known as the one dimensional. I mean, it's, it's just like saying my Toyota price can get me 60 miles per hour. Maybe I'm looking for 100 miles. So 60 miles is kind of like the performance quadrant. It's also known as one dimensional. You see this used in the literature. And then you have the absolute excite, excitement generators. So this is the latest and greatest viral app. Uh, you've done something which they have not expected. And then you have this exponential curve going towards extreme delight in it. So you either <coughs> want to be in this quadrant or at least in this quadrant where you find of getting the performance uh, out of this. I will illustrate it with an example and then you kind of build this Kano interpretation map or prioritization map. Essentially what the Kano method does is you pick a set of statistically significant customers, say 100 customers or 50 customers, it needs to be a significant number. You ask them a questionnaire for each feature in the product. And it's, it's going to be a two-part question. One part of the question is, if the feature is absent, do you like it, do you expect it, you don't care, you can live with it, and you dislike it. You also ask the question, if the feature is present, do you like it, expect it, don't care. What this does is, it can get rid of a lot of the false positives. If somebody answers that they dislike when the feature is present and also dislike it when the feature is not present, basically it's a questionable response. Typically one of the problems that you see when you send out customer services, <coughs> some of it could just be garbage here because the survey takers could just be filling up the service. Which is why in my first sentence I said, choose a statistically significant sample. If you go out with say 10 users, that's not a statistically significant sample. Go with at least 50 or 100 depending on what kind of the product you're trying to do. Uh, similar stuff. Um, some people might answer exactly in the reverse. Like when you ask them if the feature is present, they'll be like, yeah, we expect it. We don't care. We live with it. We, dis <coughs> we dislike it if the feature is present, which means they would love it if the feature is absent. So, that is kind of like self-explanatory when you see the reverse. You will also see people say, yeah, I expected the feature is present. I expected if the feature is don't present, which is basically, again, a questionable uh, kind of response. If they like it when the feature is present, and they also like it when the feature is not present, it's questionable. You really want to focus on these, this quadrant, which is basically the attractive performance and must have, which exactly maps this way. If a feature is absent and they expect it, it's kind of like okay and they can live with it. But if they dislike it if the feature is absent, that's like a performance problem because they're disliking it when the feature is absent. Um, and if they dislike it, if the feature is absent and they have any of these, this is kind of like a must have because they dislike it when the feature is not there and the rest of it falls into the other part. All of this will become easier. Let me just go through an exercise. That way you'll be kind of able to relate to it. I'll take the exact 4K exercise instead of choosing a different exercise. So that now you get to see how to choose among these competing priorities. Okay. The same 4K kind of exercise. You're launching smart glasses for a Fortune 500 company. And you need to prioritize among the below features. We talked about the 4K video recording, uh, maybe you need it to be water resistant. You want charging on the go, you want, you want wireless sync and share. Hey, throw in voice navigation as well, and then real-time sharing of point of view. So these are the set of six features that you want to kind of prioritize next. So to start off, this is what you would do. 
just as an example. I'm going to take the 4K video recording feature and then we kind of filled out the entire K-number. So the functional question would be, how do you feel about smart glasses having 4K video recording? And the responses could fall into any one of those five buckets. I like it when there's 4K video recording. I expect it. I'm neutral. I can tolerate it. I dislike it with 4K video recording. You will also ask the dysfunctional question, and you will do this with all 100 users. So all 100 users have been asked two questions for each feature. How do you feel about smart glasses not having 4K video recording? And you will record it in the exact same format. Um, there is a tweak to the Kano method, and I will cover it why it is important. People also tack on a third person, which is called the importance person. So other than the functional and the dysfunctional, you could also ask them, independently how important is 4k video recording for you rate it on a scale of one to nine and we we'll use this at the very end to see what we do with that information there are also certain kano rules i talked about some of them i talked about the interpretation map so if you have functional and dysfunctional responses with both like dislike live with expected if they have answered same in both categories so those are all possible data you can throw out that kind of data because it won't add much value. Performance features are where users like having them and dislike not having them. I mean, you're giving them the performance, it's not exciting them, but that's what it is. Must be features are when customers miss it, if they don't have that feature, they won't buy the product without that feature. For example, single sign on, which I talked about, could be a must feature for that reason. Uh, attractive features are where users like having a feature that's not expected. <coughs> Imagine you're trying out the iPhone for the very first time, it's 2004 or 2005. Looking at this device which looks unlike any of the other foldable smartphones of that time, that's kind of like an attractive feature. Something which you have not expected and you have kind of over um, Functional and dysfunctional responses with I am neutral or I can tolerate it are not indifferent which is self explanatory I mean, I can tolerate it and neutral is also not adding much value to it. Um, I talked about marking them reverse. We'll talk about the importance question. You could give them this questionnaire and then actually tag on an importance question to each one of those questions. So when you do this exercise with 100 users for the six features that we talked about, you'll end up with a table that looks something like this. The format of the table is not important. The conclusions that you draw from the table are going to be important. You have your features kind of listed on the left hand side of the table, and then you have your buckets that we talked about. The must be, the performance, the attractive, the indifferent, reverse, and personal. Uh, this is the total number of users that you kind of surveyed, which was kind of like the 100 users. And this will be the category into which the response kind of falls. If you look at the 4K video recording, you'll notice that about 56 users said it was attractive, 10 were indifferent, 4 answered in the reverse, 5 were questionable, and then you have the rest. So it clearly means a majority of users felt that this was an attractive feature. That's that's how you kind of pick this. The second feature, water resistant, uh, it's a must have or a must be, which is where you saw the majority kind of coming. You put that in this pocket. You will also have features like charge on the go where customers are indifferent. I can tolerate it, I can live with it, I don't care, I'm neutral, which which is clearly the user base telling you they are indifferent towards this feature. It won't matter whether you have this feature or not. Then wireless sync, it's again in the performance bucket, and then voice navigation in the point, point of view shift. What you'll end up with usually is multiple buckets with the head with the must be or with the performance, you could also end up with multiple interactive uh, kind of features. For this example, I'm gonna focus on the must be and the performance. Uh, and how do we further rank this on top of it? You've taken the data, you surveyed the field, you come up with this table. Now, what do you do with it? You go back to the same four boxed quadrant, and you remember the quadrants, um, this was basically the must be indifferent, attractive, and performance. You have the scores from your previous table. You know the category into which it forms. The very first thing you're going to put is the charge on the go. You got a score, a certain score, and the highest was in the indifferent. 
So it goes into this pod, <coughs> and I'm I'm gonna not bother about this feature because majority said they were indifferent to this feature. Given my limited time and resources, I'm not gonna waste my engineering team's time by focusing on this feature. So at the very get go, you've eliminated features which are a waste for the customer. Then you go into the must be category, and then if you remember the table one slide ago, there were actually two features: voice navigation and water resistance. I can even go back to it. So in the must be, you have water resistance and voice navigation. Within the same bucket, the voice navigation actually ranked much higher. You actually have a score: fifty-eight versus forty-two. Fifty-eight of your users within your entire sample are kind of telling you. Voice navigation is a much higher priority, so you do a sub ranking within the squadron. You put both the features in the squadron. Voice navigation is much more important, followed by water buses. If push comes to shove, we'll talk about timelines and prioritization. If there is only one must-have feature that you need to go out with, this is your absolute one feature MVP. This is how you actually get to an MVP. Many people talk about MVPs, but this is a data-based approach by which you can get to that minimal viable product. Because so many customers said, make it voice navigation. Having done that, uh, you focus on the next quadrant, which is performance. This is the minimum bar you have to meet. They will absolutely dislike it if you don't have it. They won't buy your device. Once you have met the bar. You go to your next quadrant, which is performance. You're still not at attractive, but you're kind of trying to raise the bar. So if I go back to the bicycle experiment, this is the bicycle, this is the scooter, and this is the 300 cc motorbike. So you started with the bicycle. Now we are getting to the scooter, where we're giving them performance. Say you're going a little faster than a bicycle. Within the performance segment in the last table, we had. Two things: the wireless sync and the real-time point of view share. You again rank them based on the score that you got. And the very last one, which they didn't expect because there was no other headset with this in our made-up example, would be this interactive feature of 4K video stream. The another advantage of this quadrant is you've created a map for your engineering to focus on the right features. You cannot ship without this feature, so all your time and effort will be focused on it. Once you have met this within your agile scrum or sprint, you would focus on these two features. Once that is done, you'll get to the most ambitious plan of them all, which is the four feature. Okay, and this is the final feature priority that you kind of end up with. Like I said. There is no use shipping this product without the must-haves, which is the voice navigation, which is why this goes first. All your engineering effort will be devoted on that. Then you get to water resistance. Then you start building your scooter, the wireless sync, real-time POV share. And then you get to the 300 cc motorcycle. Going back to that. Okay. So this is one of the methods that you can use uh, for prioritization. There is one other method. Which is called the Moscow model. Um, it's pretty similar. I mean, similar in the sense it also has buckets. It has a must-have, should-have, could-have, and won't-have this type. The difference between the Kano and the Moscow is this: Moscow is intimately married with the agile process. Um, Kano is great at kind of getting the customer viewpoint and then surveying people and whatnot. Moscow is great when working with your engineering teams because it could turn out a certain feature is much more resource or effort intensive. So as part of the Moscow model, you have the Scrum support kind of embedded very well. So especially for a new product, it's just like the vision you're asking. Sometimes it could be like I don't have a lot of data from outside. I know this is the strength of my team. And I, as the product manager, just based on my competitive research, have a feel of where it's supposed to go. One could use something in the future. Uh, the advantages of this is you break down your main features, all the features, because it's a prioritization exercise. You know, you got to build this 4K headset. You break down those into project increments, which is the central principle behind Agile. You take your epics, break them down into stories. Story points, user features, so on and so forth. Then you go to all of your teams. Um, 
your marketing, engineering, custom development, DevOps, and then you basically ask them to kind of provide estimates for these increments. This is exactly similar to how Scrum creates them. In fact, Scrum also does estimation exercises before your Scrum or Sprint kind of gets built up. Each increment is assigned a time box and an effort, so it kind of putting data behind it. You look at some of your previous projects, you look at what was done, and you come up with time box and efforts. A good rule of thumb is your must-have should not exceed 60% of the total effort. Just like the must-have is critical in the k model, the must-have is also critical in the Moscow model, which is the very minimum you need to ship out with the product. But you don't want your entire product to be filled just with the must -have. You want to address the performance and the attractive features as well, which is why uh, it just cannot be an add-on product. So that's kind of the thumb rule. Uh, similar to the indifferent, the nice thing about the Moscow model is features mark won't have to not make it into itself. So once again, you are actually helping the team. So one of the other common questions or common challenges for product managers is how do you earn trust with your engineering teams? So you earn trust with your engineering teams over time by writing crisp, precise product requirements by actually prioritizing properly. Nobody loves a lot of churn. I mean, you came up with a set of features on Monday, you came up with a different set of features on Friday, uh, you certainly won't earn trust for the engineer. But you do this right, you make their job easier by taking out features which are, where the customers are indifferent, won't have, it makes life easier for everybody. Okay. Um, the last prioritization that we're going to look at is a benefit versus a cost. So all prioritizations need not fall into the customer story or the time box or the engineering effort. Sometimes for mature companies, they could be simple the revenue, operating expenses, other kinds of provisions. You could also get into other financial features, but I'll just focus on this at a very simple level. There's a lot more detailed analysis than most people. But the same 4K product, once again, you could create a matrix where you have the features on the extreme left hand side. And then you look at various buckets. So the number of effort in terms of man hours for your engineering team to actually deliver it, because that's related to your head cost. You could have the greatest idea on earth, but if it means you have to increase your headcount by 20 more people, it might work for a large company, but it won't work for a bootstrap kind of startup. So your very first thing is going to be effort, because that's what it takes to ship this product. There will be operation costs, like you could be renting space in the cloud, or you could be contracting out your UI, UX design work. You could be maybe contracting out your DevOps work. It's obviously going to be operational costs, like servers, so on and so forth. There is going to be a revenue projection. So as part of your product management proposal for this product, you would have studied the competition and come up with this is the total available market, this is the serviceable market. Within the serviceable market, this is going to be my revenue projection. Because this idea was all about a sports subscription service, the reason it's been marked like 2K per account, and which could be lifetime value, like with each sports subscription bundled with this device. The product manager is projecting for this particular feature of 4K video recording, I'm going to get 2K additional per account. It could be any kind of the metrics that you kind of come up with. You also want to look at engagement. How much has your engagement gone up? Because the product is one among the spectrum of the rest of the products. This was for a media company. There are other kind of subscriptions there. By buying this product or for this particular feature, is this the payload? The tech companies talk about the payload. For example, for voice search, people right now use voice devices and voice search to look up information. Maybe in the future they'll be shopping on these things, which is called the payload. So as when you roll out this feature, can it drive engagement up for the company, which is what you're kind of looking at. You're also looking at daily average users, what is the number of users that are using this. Maybe 10K people are using this particular product. And then you look at the competition and then come up with an overall category for this product. Uh, most of it will speak to itself. So you kind of look at how much revenue projection you're getting versus the effort that you're putting in hours. Engineering will also get a chance to weigh in on this table. Like, this is great, they're getting 2K per account, but they do have to spend a lot of time. 
but it could be justified because it's, it's really important for the company to have it. So this could be kind of like a benefit versus cost analysis. This is not the only way to do this. You could have all other kind of financial metrics. You could have a discounted payback period, the time it takes to recoup money on the product. You could have margins. Are we like, what are we doing with the margins on the product? So, so. Okay. Um, so we looked at that, um, all the prioritization kind of stuff. There is one other metric which is um, which was made popular. This was made popular in, in the 2007, 2008. Uh, David McClure, uh, who was a venture capitalist, kind of came up with this method. It was used a lot in the early days when we didn't have as many apps. And this is what uh, the method is about. So by the name of it, it sounds like a pirate cry, right? which is why it's called the pirate matrix. So this model is marked a little, but I'll talk about what the model is about, at least for the frame of the in that time when we didn't have a lot of apps, it was much easier to retain users. It was like the wild, wild west and everybody was in a land grab for getting users onto their latest and greatest apps. This was 2007, 2008, those kind of things. So the very first thing was acquisition. How do you actually get users to kind of sign up? Um, and there are various kind of metrics that you can use for your framework. You could look at page visits, you could look at micro conversion, where you've displayed an ad and people have watched the video. You could look at your banner ad click through rate. You could look at organic search. Are people searching for your product on, say, Google or some of the search engines? You could look at TV advertising, what it's bringing you, and you could also look at social media. But the focus in the early days was definitely on acquisition. So this works well for some of the physical products and some of the, some of the apps. The next thing that you do is, once you have acquired these users, do they have a great first experience? The moment they're on their website for the very first time, um, do you convert them from just being a casual visitor to actually registering on your site, which is what I mean by conversion. The home page to sign up page flow, is it pretty intuitive? Does it flow well like a LinkedIn page? Does it get you through a couple of screens? Um, how many number of visitors in trial? Like many products launch in beta, uh, how many number of visitors do you have in product? Number of activations, number of visitors using features. So these all could be part of your metrics and how a product manager could track any of these. The reason you want to track these is to kind of tweak the numbers. What you do. Great, you have your users, you have the activation. Now you want to retain these users. You want to give them a good experience so that they keep on coming back for us. Repeat customers. Um, types of merchandise or SaaS kind of purchase, if it's that kind of product. You should also watch out for churn, how many downgrades, how many cancels. These are all metrics that you can use for any b 2 b b 2 any kind of product. You would also look at usage patterns. What do they shop for? What do they buy on the website? What kind of services are they signing up? So that you get ideas about any other services that you could tell to the customers. Um, and the most important of them all, how do you actually make money? They have been great products, but you require a way to monetize these products. So Twitter is a great example. Uh, I believe they've started to make some money. But it's that essential challenge. You could have a great product with millions of users, but how do you actually make money and monetize the product? So a product manager can kind of look at metrics like revenue per customer, lifetime revenue per customer, which is kind of like a projection of this customer stayed with a with us, how much do we make kind of from the customer. We would also look at margins. It's a bit of a interesting enterprise kind of thing. The very last one is do users tell others? So this is referral, word of mouth. For example, you read an Uber. You get a coupon and say, hey, you can send this to your friend. You had a great experience, you want to tell your friends. That's how your app is going to go. So do users tell others? Are there referrals? You can track the number of referrals, invitations, word of mouth, social media posts and reviews. Uh, so all this you could kind of use it as part of your product market fit. As you can see, there's literally like 20 metrics right here. A good product manager will mix and match. Look at all the way from acquisition, activation, retention, the revenue, and to the referral process. And this is one database approach with which you can actually tweak your product market. 
So the original prioritization on this was at that time because it was a wild, wild west. Everybody wanted to kind of do a land grab. The focus was on acquisition. This was the early days of Web 2.0. For for example, the time when Facebook came out, when Twitter came out, and Snap came out. But there are problems with this approach, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, let me cover one other framework before I come back to this one. As part of the same product market fit, there is one other framework which is pretty famous. It's called Porter's Five Forces. This is actually credited to Professor Michael Porter, who was at Harvard, uh, came about in the late 1970s. So what this focuses on is five segments, because now we are in the product market kind of thing. There is the power of bias. You could be in a segment where the buyers have absolute power. So it's a buyers kind of market. There's also the power of suppliers. There's the threat of substitutes, threat of new entrants, and the general competitive rivalry within the industry. So to take the same 4K example, uh, just to kind of make it much more clear, what is the power of bias here? There are not many VR headset entrepreneurs. The VR industry is quite amazing. Competition does not have voice controls. You could be the very first one. If you remember my prioritization exercise, voice recognition is kind of like the must have. So if you actually bring out the feature, it's like you have a competitive advantage there. Consumers cannot exert price pressure. So what you're trying to essentially see in the product market fit is how much pressure can consumers exert on you? So if it's another has ran product among a crowded field of products, if not you, customers would shift to a different product. In this particular example, consumers cannot exert the pricing and pressure. Then you look at the power of supplies. The parts used for the VR headset in this case are also used in smart displays. There's a wide variety of supplies in China or other countries. Alternatives exist for your supply chain. You always protect your supply chain, you optimize it. Um, the amount of money you make on a physical product is intimately connected with your supply chain. Say for the iPhone, to a certain markup, there's a certain amount of money that Apple spends on making the product. But your supply chain is crucial, um, which is why companies diversify. All of their manufacturing is never put in one place. Same with the kind of work that you outsource to your software contractors. You don't want to be at the mercy of one organization, you always spread out your work. It's great for your contracts, it's great for your pricing, because this way you get much more competitive price. And the last two buckets, threat of new entrants. Mm, depending on the analysis that you have from your engineering team and other places, you could decide in threat of new entrants, it might take a new entrant two years to catch up to your features. You have a head start. Um, and maybe you have a patent on this 4K smoothing technology, which only you have. That's having a new entrant cannot disrupt you. If it was in a particular segment where a new entrant could disrupt you, that will change your timelines and your product market. Maybe you go to market sooner in Asia versus like this, where maybe the cost of rolling out is much cheaper. And the last one is the threat of substitutes. Um, sure, you could have a substitute variety of smart glasses, but the cheaper variety of glasses cannot deliver the same VR experience. There's a premium that customers pay with a high-end VR headset versus a cheap headset. And in this particular idea, the difference could be quite jarring when you go from a cheap headset to a bigger headset. Uh, it could spoil the whole experience. So what you're trying to assess is, can a substitute fraud kind of disrupt the market? Also, substitutes will not have the video streaming ecosystem in place. You remember the whole idea was about having the video streaming in place. Even if somebody came up with a substitute, they would also have to provide the same value that you're doing through your media system. So, a product manager can, can kind of look at these five buckets. For competitive rivalry, you could look at competitive research, dark magic quadrants, look at how much gap you have between your competition. You could do a competitive analysis, various ways to do that. You can use this framework to tweak your approach. Once again, you could go after new markets. Um, you could roll out features sooner. You could use this to convince your stakeholders, and so on and so forth. So, this is one way to kind of tweak your product market. Okay. So, we did talk about the pirate metrics model. Uh, what are the problems with this model? The Porter's five forces works fine. You can apply it in a lot of cases. 
but especially if you want to focus a little bit uh, on the mobile app space. So the Pirate Metrics model is pretty popular. The problems are it focuses on acquisition as the first step. If you just Google the statistics, um, mobile apps actually lose 60 to 70 percent of their users in the first week of download. Sure, you have this viral app, which has been a great hit. You made a buzz, you've been covered in CNN and New York Times. But you will lose 60 to 70 percent of your users in the first week if you don't keep on um, incentivizing them, don't keep on rolling out these features. In three months, actually, the number jumps to 90%. If you've been following the uh, the revenue and the quarter earnings from various social media companies, many of the social media stocks have been slammed in the past three or four months, the Twitter, the Facebook, so on and so forth, because the daily average users and other kinds of engagement metrics are kind of plateauing for most of these services, which are mobile app and other app-based kind of services. The acquisition model worked very well in the initial days where there were not many competition, competitor automakers. People would stick on with a particular app. Right now, if you look either in the iOS or in the Android space, you have millions of apps. It's, it's really crowded out there. So this does not work well in a crowded mobile app. So the metrics that you kind of use from this would be quite misleading. You can have great acquisition metrics. You can have great page views, so on and so forth. But if you lose all these users within the first three months, it wouldn't bring in much revenue for you, which, which is the problem with this model. The million users in acquisition looks great, but if you're kind of losing the users, ultimately it doesn't mean much, which is what I mean by the retention rate, say, being only one person. So people came up with a different model, uh, which is kind of like an inverse of the pirate metrics model. And the focus is um, a little bit different. <coughs> so especially for mobile apps, this model works much better than the pirate metrics model. So you forget about acquisition, you actually focus on the retention. When you do your limited beta or whatever kind of beta or you roll out your service, even if it's a small number of users, your focus should be on turning these into your repeat customers. And definitely focus on your churn, which is your downgrades and enhancements. On paper, it might not look much different, but in terms of product market fit and strategy, it's a huge difference. Because if you focus on acquisition, you focus mostly on your channels, your marketing, your sales, that's where your effort will be spent. If you actually focus on the retention, you make sure the pain points of the customers have been addressed. Even though it's a limited set of customers, that's what you find the focus on. Because these customers can be repeat customers for you and then you're going to get much enhanced uh, lifetime revenue from these customers. The next step after retention is going to be the activation. You get the experience right the first time, so it's not just the buzzwords, so on and so forth. You focus on your conversions, the home page to sign up page. Um, you look at your rest of the metrics and the number of visitors using the features. You iterate and roll out features much faster because you want to keep this experience quite pleasant for your customers. And then you go to the referral. If you remember, referral was kind of like the last step. In this case, you go to referral much early because this model is a little bit inverted. You're starting off at a small base. You're kind of giving them a pleasant experience. Now you want these customers to serve as the word of mouth referral for you, which is the right way to build. Companies talk about organic search and going slowly. This is how they kind of do it. You incentivize the referral early. You institute referral patterns in your product early. Hey, if you use this particular subscription service, you get 10% off on your video subscription or something like that. Invitations, gamification, a lot of companies do gamification, which is how they keep people motivated. Um, and then definitely look at the revenue. Once you have done the first three steps right, then you maximize your lifetime revenue for customer. And this inherently happens if you get the experience right the first time which goes back to the question of you having prioritized the right product features. Imagine if you did a sloppy um, sloppy exercise of prioritizing the wrong features, you would not be able to retain the customers in the first place. So it, it goes back to that same structure kind of design. And the very last step is acquisition. Only after the four steps are done, you kind of focus on the stuff. There is a place for acquisition, 
definitely focus on your sales channels, focus on your micro conversion, focus on native advertising, all other forms. But this is a much more structured approach to kind of Google, which is what most of the startups and most of the companies are doing. Okay, um, I'm done with most of them and I'll open it up for questions. Just a couple of recommendations on books. Where can I find more information? Um, these are some of the books which I have found definitely useful. Um, the Decision Book, it's like, it's got 15 models for strategic thinking. This can be like food for thought. You can look at various structured kind of thinking models. Um, the other book that I like is Decode and Conquer. Um, especially if you're preparing for interviews, it has a great framework called the Circles Framework. It's uh, It kind of teaches you how to answer some of the interview questions, especially if you're interviewing. I would definitely say this time. Um, I would also suggest the design thinking playbook. This is more suited for mobile apps and other software kind of stuff. It's a great book, very visual in nature. Um, it can also give you some of the frameworks. Uh, three additional books. Um, this is always a popular one. How do you build habit forming products? Uh, the author does a great job of kind of telling you what makes a product viral. The Design of Everyday Things is not a product management book, it's actually a design book, um, but you can actually gain a lot of knowledge looking at common everyday products. Why is a kettle designed that way? What user point does the kettle solve by doing that, so on and so forth. Okay. And the last one I would say is uh, Inspired. These are not the only books, there are multiple other books, but if you wanted to focus on products, a little bit of design and structured thinking, um, those would be the ones that I'm kind of focused on.